Well, now that we're a few weeks removed from the holy month of pride, hopefully it's safe to take a look back with just a little bit of scrutiny at the risk of facing the wrath of the righteous, of course. But there's one piece of wisdom that I personally always try to keep in focus. The unexamined life is not worth living. It's what Socrates said at his trial. And I take it to mean that with everything that you do in life, you should be able to explain why. And if you can't explain why you do a particular thing, well, maybe you shouldn't be doing that at all. And that's the one thing more frustrating about Pride Month than the obvious and unavoidable onslaught of rainbows and gender bending. It's the lack of definition and purpose. Because after all, it's 2022, as the activists often say. So why do we need these gestures? Is it simply for awareness? Because we are all well aware. At this point, I think sliced bread in the wheel are less known to people. Perhaps there are some isolated tribes somewhere remote who have yet to be forced to taste the rainbow, but scientists are still searching. Is it about political activism? If so, please point to the law that actively discriminates against gay people. And do be specific, because outside of extremely isolated cases, all the major institutions of American political power have exerted that influence and force to the efforts of the activism in recent years. So if this is about political change, that change is actually the status quo. Is it fighting oppression? Well, if so, the very existence of this celebration cuts against any oppression claim, at least systemically, and even more so when the celebration isn't just a holiday, but a holla month. When that national celebration is recognized with a presidential proclamation, it's not oppression. When pro athletes and entertainers and other public figures are browbeaten into not just toleration, but active affirmation, regardless of their own personal convictions, it is not oppression. When your holiday is commodified with feature displays at major retailers, sure, they're out of baby formula, but at least there are plenty of My First Pride onesies to clothe your starving baby, it is not oppression. In fact, it's a grotesque misprioritization in your favor. Now, in fairness, the only reason these pride onesies are so well stocked is because nobody buys them and then they get donated to some third world country because it'd be too offensive to put them on clearance. And then the poor kid who actually does end up wearing them will be killed for the crime in some country where homosexuality is actually illegal because that is what actual oppression looks like. The point is, when all of these theoretical reasons for Pride Month are satisfied and it's still not enough, there must be something else motivating it. If simply being left alone is insufficient and instead constant affirmation and celebration are necessary, perhaps this is more about influencing and controlling the way others think and behave and less about protecting the way you do. Because after all, if we all agreed on freedom, the bargain would be you are entitled to the basic freedom of your associations and relationships up to and including whatever consensual adult oddities you like behind your closed door. But that respect for your freedom comes with an obligation to reciprocate an even more basic freedom to others, the freedom to think whatever the hell they want about it up to and including outright mockery. And if you refuse that deal, if instead the deal is freedom for you to do whatever you want, but no freedom for others to make fun of it, well, then this isn't really a deal about freedom at all. It's just a power move in pursuit of domination and submission, as in the actual political kind, not the Pride Month kind. That is why the meme at issue in today's story has become so powerful. Number one, because there is an element of truth to the idea that this is all about domination, not freedom. But number two, because the most effective counter to authoritarianism, whether it's political or just cultural, is mockery. That combination of truth and effective mockery is how you get this image, the hilarious pride progress flag swastika, which I'm not sure if Susan will allow to be shown. If she keeps it up, she's promoting Hitler in the way that she promised her media overlords she wouldn't. But if she takes it down, well then she's betraying the very pride symbol her intersectional overlords command her to promote. So forget Sophie's choice. Susan's choice is a much more difficult conflict of values. But of course, that image isn't just bait for Susan. It's bait and a test for all rainbow authoritarians, because if they actually agree to the bargain of freedom, 
they'll show the restraint to allow it, despite their personal opposition. If instead they're seeking the exercise of power, well, then they'll exercise that power, all while denying that exercise entirely, of course, because nothing says not a fascist like arresting your enemies for the high crime of sharing an opinion, even if it is a clever, graphically enhanced opinion, which is exactly what happened in this case. At the end of June, Lawrence Fox, a British actor turned campaigner and leader of the British Reclaim Party, shared that blasphemous pride flag swastika image on Twitter to commemorate the blessed and most holy month. For that, his account was later suspended, but while the tweet was up, it was retweeted by a Hampshire man named Darren Brady. He's a 51-year-old army veteran. Some reporting says Brady simply retweeted the image without adding his own commentary. Other reporting, which quotes Brady, says he reposted the image in a debate forum that he frequents, perhaps both. In some or multiple forms, he amplified the reach of the image. And for that, someone reported Brady not just to Twitter or the host of the forum in which he participates, but to the Hampshire police, who showed up at his house not just with a warning, but with a Stasi-esque re-education extortion threat. Police told Brady he could pay an 80-pound fee to take an educational course to see the error in his ways, but if he doesn't, he faces arrest and potential criminal charge for the supposedly hateful act of clicking the wrong button on a computer screen. Brady said he needed some time to consider his options, and the police agreed to return another day for his decision. In the meantime, Brady contacted Fox, the original poster of that flag meme, as well as Harry Miller, a former police officer who works with Fox at the Bad Law Project, the organization the two run together to fight what they call ideology disguised as law, of which they say this case is an example, and the two agreed to go to Brady's home in anticipation of the police officer's return. And on Thursday, they did return, and apparently Brady said no thank you to their kind offer of just 80 pounds for re-education, and police wanted further discussion on the matter, but were refused entry into the home. And because of this refusal, to further discuss the offense, police then arrested Brady, some footage of which was recorded by Fox and posted on his YouTube channel. Tell us why you escalated it to this level, because I don't understand. I posted something that he posted, you come to arrest me, you don't arrest him, why has it come to this? Why am I in cuffs? Because of something he shared, then I shared. Because someone has been caused, obviously, anxiety based upon your social media page. Just in case there's any doubt about why this altercation is happening, no, according to police themselves, it is no more complicated than it appears. You shared a meme that caused anxiety to an unknown accuser, even though the meme wasn't directed at that person specifically. It's just something that person happened to see. What even is the crime here? Because causing anxiety surely can't be it. I'm caused anxiety when I walk into Target and see queer socks featured where they used to be things people actually buy. I'm caused anxiety when I see the pride flag flying where the American flag doesn't. I'm caused anxiety every single time that I log into Twitter because most tweets I see are anxiety-inducingly moronic. That's really the point. And in none of these cases does my personal anxiety justify kicking down other people's doors over it. Another legal point I'm unclear on, and I don't understand your limey law, so perhaps one of you redcoats can inform me, but without a clear legal basis for the arrest, as in a clear crime alleged and charged, what is the legal basis for the forcible entry into the home anyway? Police say the fact that they were refused entry is why the arrest was made, but refusal of entry is the default. They don't have a right to enter unless they show it in the form of a warrant, and they can't show a warrant unless it's based on a crime, but the specifics of that crime are never explained. According to Miller, police weren't able to explain it at the scene, other than this causing anxiety description. But if causing anxiety is an arrestable offense, every single British person will be locked up. Everyone is guilty of that. You might even cause anxiety by being overly polite, so don't just watch your memes watch your pleasantries, too. And Brady wasn't the only arrest on the day, actually. Miller, the ex-cop, attempted to intervene in Brady's arrest, putting himself in the middle and telling the arresting officers they'll have to go through him first. Well, apparently they did, and arrested Miller for obstruction, and 
as they were hauling him away, he committed yet another high crime of mockery. Have you got anything on you that could harm me or you? Uh, just my razor sharp Can we get the letter from the, the chief? Both men have since been released from custody. Brady tweeted a selfie on Sunday saying, It's nice to be able to enjoy a Sunday morning in peace without being harassed by the Hampshire police trying to extort money from me or have me re-educated for sharing a meme on the internet. As far as I can tell, the terms of any prosecution of him or Miller are unclear, but unlikely now that the police commissioner, the elected official who runs the police force, is publicly criticizing the police action. She says she's concerned with both the proportionality and the necessity of the police response to this incident, when incidents on social media receive not one but two visits from police officers, but burglaries and non-domestic break-ins don't always get a police response, something is wrong, she says. She pledges to work with the police academy and other leadership to ensure guidance is more clear on the issue. Well, great, at least in this one instance, but that doesn't really answer the question of what was the guidance before? Were these officers following that guidance or were these officers just going rogue. And of course, even if this was following orders, every individual officer has a personal choice of whether to personally participate or not. But inquiring minds want to know, is this just one-off individual officer misconduct or did this incident reflect broader priorities of the police department overall? Because clarification of the guidance implies that there is guidance for memory and really there need not be any, or at least Almost none. Here's the only necessary guidance. Is it a threat of imminent lawless action? If not, then move along because it's not a crime. It's just a guy with an opinion, edgy or not, but opinions are perfectly within the rights of the people. In fact, it's their most basic one. I wish I could make some joke about the American legal tradition bailing out the British this time, but that wouldn't be the honest thing to do because at least certain parts of this country are only a step or two behind this absurdity. Recall, the state of New York has now decided that your self-defense rights are dependent on their review of your Twitter account in much the same way, for example. And unlike the UK, there is no apology for that infringement. In fact, it's celebrated as an achievement. Any joke about this happening in some faraway land rests on logic that applies just as seriously here at home by politicians who even if they lack the power to do it today, will eagerly do it tomorrow the second that power is achieved. And so the mockery must remain squarely directed at them because beyond the preservation of our rights, we have crucially important questions to answer, like what swastika variants are acceptable to those who prove their opposition to it by reenacting the very authoritarianism it symbolizes? As many are asking, can we make them out of Union Jacks, for example? Is that okay? Or... How about other progressive priorities, like one made out of a hammer and sickle, or one made out of Planned Parenthood logos? And what if I wear the queer socks while posting these swastikas? Do those gestures cancel out? Because as we've established with the re-education deal, this is all transactional. Trade this for that, of course. And most importantly, once I finally am imprisoned for over-testing the boundaries of these new rules, will the pride justice finally be achieved, or... Is further punishment still necessary? Because the way this is going, it won't be nearly enough just to clap for the pride flag. Starting next Pride Month, the pride flag claps you. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Gab. That is at M L Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Come on.